Let's begin with, will you tell us your name, spell it, and your name, right. spell it, please. K-A-Y-E-S-H-A-R-P-E. -E. Catherine is officially my name, but A is what I'm known by. Bill Sharp, uh, William H. Sharp, spelled the same way. Where is it? Yes. Um, when, uh, can you remember your first uh, impression of Circular Church? My first impression of Circular was one of the people being uh, so energetic, vital, a small number of people. This was in 1943, and I really came to work for Circular uh, during the war years. I uh, worked for the, it was really a national committee, but to be uh, working through the local church. And uh, I can remember, even though there were maybe 40 people in attendance, the music was good, uh, loud singing, uh, and there just seemed to be a lot of vital energy. And you, um, My first impression, uh, of course, I came here to see Kate and coming into the church, uh, noticing at that time that there was a very small congregation. Uh, as compared to now, it was very small. And again, the uh, the friendliness of the people, and uh, you, you immediately, or I immediately felt at home in the church. How have you seen the uh, congregation change uh, over all these years? I, one of the ways the congregation has changed is in, I guess, the demographics. Uh, many of the people then were much older. The, because we were much younger, so it, it made them seem as if they were much older anyway. But my guess would be that the average age was maybe 60, 55, 60. Um, just a few young couples so that the nursery, there were not too many people, children in the nursery. Uh, but there was always a very active nursery. Laura Higdon, who was a member for years, uh, that was her special project, the, the nursery, and so she always saw that the children were there and followed up with them for years. One of her nursery children, she'd refer to them. I have heard that one of the first Sunday schools in America was established. Yes, Lance Hall was really built as one of the first Sunday schools in America and it was interdenominational for the city. This was really before my memory of it, but I've heard the story very often that people from all over the city, it was on Sunday afternoon, so there were Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, many, many different groups involved. Yes. Um, when you uh, began coming to Circular, uh, did you join as a member right away? Uh, I don't think I joined until we came back. After Bill and I uh, married, we went to graduate school together, and then two years later came back. And I was working in the official position, so uh, I had not moved my membership, but for all purposes, I was just as a uh, director is, usually. Well, what was the physical structure like? The physical structure of Circular was not too different. Uh, the arrangement in the pulpit area was somewhat different. But, um, and there was, I guess that was later that the curtain was all across the back. They thought that the acoustics would be much better and so that uh, curtains like, very much like these were across the back there. When, when I came, the choir sat here, and the organ, you see the uh, place where the organ was there. And so we sat up 
on this side and the other side of the pulpit. I was divided with one group on one side and one group on the other side. Have you been a member of the choir for all these years? I've been a member of the choir since 1946. And you I'm, must I'm, be the senior member of the choir. I'm the senior member of the choir, whatever that means. I am. <laughs> the most consistent member. That is incredible. It's just wonderful. Um, how long ago did you move from down here to up there? Uh, 15 years ago. Uh -huh. Something like 15, maybe 20 years ago, we moved from up here. How has the choir changed over um, these years? Uh, the choir actually has stayed fairly steady in, in terms of uh, members over the period of years. And I, I don't really don't think it has changed much. The cast of characters have changed. The, uh, uh, the choir directors have changed. But the choir has remained. See, we have 16, 17 members now, and it was, I remember that when we were here. Maybe not quite that many, but in, in when, I, when I first came. How about, yes, um, about the hymns. Have, have, has the list of hymns changed a, a great deal over the years? Somewhat. The, the hymn book we're using now uh, has many new hymns in it that we did not use at that time, but still we keep the old hymns that we had. Yes. I guess we all find that refreshing to hear a, a new t tune, and yet mm -hmm. sometimes we grow so fond of the old ones. It's, I, I always get a kick uh, out of us as a congregation learning a new tune. <laughs> well, it keeps you on your toes <laughs> when you learn a new, a new hymn. Yes. Do you want to? Well, you know, um, you all mentioned that you were married uh, here at Circular. Um, was the pastor who married you the current pastor of Circular at that time? He was the one that was that I worked with, yes, during those years. C. Rexford Raymond. He had been dean at Berea College in Kentucky before he became minister, uh, but was minister for. I would guess from the early 1940s, uh, probably eight or nine years was minister. And this one quote that, that Bill still uses that, that Dr. Raymond often used in his sermons. You want to yeah, say? Yeah, Dr. Raymond said he drew a circle that left me out, but I had the will and the wit to win. I drew a circle that took him in, so, and that stuck with me. Yeah, it's interesting that, that many of the ministers, there was sort of a theme or saying that they used often or something that, you, that we sort of associate with each one of the different ministers. One of the sayings that one of our ministers said that I remember very well uh, was, one person believing exactly as I do is enough. And I think that typifies circular church. <laughs> that you don't have to exactly agree with, uh, with your neighbor in the, in the same pew. That you can differ and we'll respect that. Do you um, recall a, um, a minister as being particularly memorable or uh, having a... a yeah, I think we've been really fortunate in all of our ministers. They've had different strengths. Uh, Mr. Bedford, who followed Dr. Raymond, was especially good with working with men. And he established a men's breakfast group that was very active. Was it breakfast? Dinner. That's right, at night. Yeah, night yeah. They'd meet together and the men would do the cooking and prided themselves on uh, no program, no work to do except to eat and enjoy together, being together. No, nope, no prayer. <laughs> Just this was a time we, we were church members, but we forgot all the other routines and just had a good time. 
But that, that really sort of brought the men together before that and, and even with that. The women were the ones who had really done most of the work and sort of kept the church going, but Mr. Bedford was able to bring in a number of men, uh, played golf a lot, uh, I guess was sort of a man's man. The men liked him very much. Well, speaking of men and, and women, um, have women occupied a uh, positions of uh, leadership in the church? Women have always occupied a position of leadership. I guess maybe it was more unofficially than officially. Uh, I can remember the first woman being elected to what was then known as the Standing Committee, the Council, now it's known as. Uh, that would have been probably the late 1940s or early 1950s. But uh, even though they were not in leadership roles, they were always very active. The, the strength of the church when I came uh, was the women. They're the ones, as I see it, who kept this church going in, in some pretty hard times. So we had uh, 25 and 30 here as, uh, on a Sunday morning. But there were a group of women that uh, when you got to know them, you knew this church would never fail. It, they, as long as they lived, it would be here. So they, they weren't in the leadership, but they were. They were in the leadership role in that they saw that the, that the men did things right. It was always almost a joke if there were a meeting. Someone would say, that's not according to the Constitution, and there would always be the Constitution with these, at these meetings. And Carrie Britton and some others would always uh, say something. We just heard a little bit about the Ladies Missionary Society um, yeah. who helped the pious young men. Um, yeah, that, you, oh, yeah I, I remember that. Uh, I'm not sure that I was ever an active member. Again, we sort of thought of that as the older women and there was a younger, another group for the younger women. Uh, but they always, every year, sent money to a divinity school, to a theological seminary, help a divinity student, and prided themselves on, on doing that every year. What was the, the DYS group, what was that? Well, that was, that was more of a social missionary group too, but the Lolita Woods circle yeah. was the younger women, and the Ladies Home Missionary Society was for the older women Generally. In fun, we call the DYS club the dirty young shysters. <laughs> Not to their face, but when they weren't around. Oh, they did it to themselves too. It was really the do your share. Do your club, share. But. We renamed them. <laughs> um, over the years, uh, race um, has been, race is important today as an issue. Things have changed a lot in the world. I know that um, Circular has had a, a, an interesting mm -hmm. relationship uh, when it comes to racial issues. Uh, could you describe the, the racial philosophy, yeah. such a thing could yeah. be described of Circular? I think the, the racial philosophy of circular has always been one of openness, uh, with one exception, which we may talk about a little bit. But uh, each one of the ministers was uh, open in his philosophy. Dr. Raymond, who came from Berea, uh, there were, I believe, black students there then when he was there, which was unusual, but certainly was very open. Uh, one of my early memories, and I guess it was the first year that I was in, at Circular, which would have been 1943, uh, we did an interdenominational, interracial Thanksgiving service here. And um, there was lots of excitement uh, about doing it. And the, there was a citadel 
professor who was, uh, I'm not sure whether he was the organist at the Citadel or just enjoyed playing the organ. And he was going to be the organist for the service. And at the last minute, the Citadel forbade him to play the organ at this interracial service. So we needed, had to get somebody else at the last minute. But uh, Avery School, which was founded by the American Missionary Association, which was the Congregational Church, uh, was very active. That was the black school in the city. Had the reputation of being the best black school, I guess, in the Southeast. Still black graduates. Uh, if there's a write-up in the newspaper that they've graduated from Yale or wherever, they will also say in the write-up, I'm a graduate of Avery, so that um, that school was here and it was easy to work with the faculty there. Uh, the faculty were black, but uh, that was one of the sources that, that we worked with uh, with a group. And there was also a very active interracial group in the city made up of some of the best known citizens, which, which was unusual, uh, citizens who were well known throughout the city and respected. So uh, not only Circular, but Ch Charleston itself was somewhat unusual as a Southern city for interracial activities. Yeah. Well, I, I know that the 60s were a very um, turbulent time, and uh, I, I have heard that you've played a, somewhat of a prominent role in uh, S Circular. Do we, you care to talk about that a little when, bit? Uh, when I came to Circular, and for years after I came, this church was always known as uh, open to everybody. And then, uh, Anybody who would, wanted to come could come here. Uh, and so when the, at the height of the desegregation process, we wanted to sort of lead the way and take a vote to show that we were open. And so we prepared to do that. And at a meeting prior to the vote on a Sunday morning, the minister, who I will not name, got up and opposed it. And, and uh, that caused uh, quite some problems and there was a split. Uh, and so the next Sunday there was a vote. I was president of the congregation at that time. The vote was 26 to 25 not to open the doors of the church when we thought we were open all the time. Uh, within, oh, well, to follow up on that, I, I made the statement to the congregation that I would resign as president of the congregation and I would not stay as president if we were close to, to other people. Uh, but within a matter of uh, weeks, that was resolved. Some of the people who, who are perhaps were diehard segregationists left. And so within a matter of a, a month, a couple of months, it was all clear. It wasn't as bad as it seemed. The interesting thing about it was the the minister himself who spoke out against the vote had been very open and many of his sermons were about be, being an open church uh, he gave us his reasons fear that the stained glass windows would be broken uh, that we needed not to lead the way but to just be available to to do it and work more quietly behind the scenes, he felt. Uh, so, but it, but it was confusing to us when all of these Sundays we've been hearing sermons about the open door and, and then uh, leading in the fight not to open it to, to blacks. Well, I, I salute you for uh, making a stand. Hmm. Over the years, Circular has been home to many um, people who could not find a home, uh, who wanted to begin a group. I'm thinking of uh, people against rape, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, gay organizations, interfaith crisis ministry. Uh, the list is Hotline. Long. Hotline. No. Uh, the list is long. 
and it somehow seems to fit into the tradition mm -hmm. of circular, but at times people have had to take the stand. Um, were you um, involved in any of those kinds of startups? Or, uh, not, not as much as early on. Most of those were done when Bob Boston was minister. And uh, I was involved in the sense that I was involved in the founding of the counseling center. Bob really did the work, but I was one of the counselors early on. And it was through that counseling center that many of these developed. So to that, to that extent, I was involved. And so. that was a new concept uh, at that time, mm -hmm. was it not, yeah. to have a counseling center associated yeah. with a church? Yeah, I think we were the only one uh, in this area and uh, for board of directors, there was a, a broad group of citizens for the board of directors. Uh, there was a Jewish man, uh, Episcopalian, uh, I'm sure some other denominations, but two of the leaders of the board of directors was, one was Joe Mendelson, who's still very active in the city here. and. Um, Dick Sosnowski from the Medical University, who's a very active Episcopalian. And um, it was, as I said, a, a broad-based background for the Board of Directors. Did you have a question, Nicole? I think Circular has been more involved in the community uh, since the 60s. Uh, earlier than that, it was um, a real part of the community, but it, it wasn't uh, as actively organizing new things and, and that sort of thing. It was more a supportive organization for, for other groups. For a while, we didn't have uh, uh, regular ministers, uh, and uh, that that caused us some some concern. So we could get ministers wherever we could. We uh, one story is that we we had what we call layman's week, layman's month. So for the four Sundays in the month, we had a different layman preach a sermon, and I was one of those who preached the uh, the last sermon and prepared my sermon well, telling myself that if they followed what I told them, this church would really prosper. So they took me down a little bit when the, the uh, choir director after my sermon got up and, say, and said, our final hymn will be safely through another week. <laughs> yeah, that strikes me that yeah. uh, Circular has a sense of humor. Yeah, as always, I think. And uh, I don't think we've gone a year without a minister. Maybe between ministers, between ministers there would be uh, an interim minister or, or maybe just uh, ministers in the city would fill in for us. Um, how about social events? Do any memorable social events come to mind? Yeah, they, they were always circular. Women have always been interested in social activities. Uh, one of their money raising things every year was to um, have turkey dinners, which they would sell the dinners. All the members would buy, come in and buy the dinners and the women would work for long hours and people in the community would come and, and buy the dinners. Uh, there would be picnics in the summer for that. Uh, and, and just generally social events. During World War II, uh, there were on um, Thursday nights and Sunday nights, social events for the service people in the area. And there are 
must have been considerable number yeah. of service people yeah. in the, area, <coughs> yeah. in the base. Yeah, and it's not too unusual even now to get letters from uh, servicemen who were here during World War II. Uh, I guess it was last year we had a, a man come in to visit and uh, he was here, stationed here, and just wanted to come back and, and visit. He'd been here in the early 40s. This being a port of embarkation, many of the men were shipped out from here. One of the meetings that I recall, uh, one of the groups was a hippie group that uh, I'm sure that Bob Boston mentioned. He had a, uh, <clears throat> a dinner meeting once a week. Was it once a week or once a month? Once a week. Once a week. Yeah. Yeah. What was interesting to me was the backing that the, the older women, who I call the backbone of the church, they came down, they took a look at it, they saw what was happening, and all and pitched right in. There's no no questions asked. And that was that was quite an event to, to, to have meetings for this group when nobody else was holding. And I expect that Bob mentioned to you about the runaways during those years. Did he say something about that too? And we started to talk about yeah, that. and there were a number of us who uh, served as. Uh, not surrogate mothers, but at least would keep children, teenagers, often these would be 14, 15, 16 year olds who had run away and uh, would keep them for a night or two or three nights, feed them, try to help them get on their way, whatever, wherever they were going. Often they didn't know, they were just sort of going from city to city. But uh, Bob was instrumental in getting that set up. I think the community has always looked at circular as being a little different and maybe a little way out and maybe a little strange, uh, but yet even with that attitude have looked at it with respect and, and admiration for the willingness to, to do things differently. I think I'd use a word avant-garde more than I would some of the other words that, that you brought there. Uh, I, it's been interesting what the community thought about some of the things that we did here. Uh, you, you would hear it obliquely. You'd hear it here, hear it there, uh, that uh, all these peculiar people go to circular church. And they may have been right in a, to a degree, the good peculiar people. 